Welcome to Damage Control, how to address issues you would rather not discuss in an interview. I'm Claire Klieger, Senior Associate Director on the college team, and I'm joined today by my colleague. Hi, I'm Ann Dickinson, also on the college team. And first, we're going to take a look at what we would like to cover. Frequently, we hear from individuals who are worried about issues from their present or past that they feel could be an issue for potential employers. We're going to review the most common types of these possible red flags, when it makes the most sense to disclose this information, and how to do so when and if the time comes. In the later part of our session, we will cover the best approaches for framing this discussion, depending upon the nuances unique to the challenge or challenges you may be facing. Lastly, we'll offer tips on how to avoid potential new missteps so that you may have minimal damage to control in future interviews. We all have things in our past we may not be happy about and that we wish we could have done better or handled differently. To err is to be human after all. Bad things can happen and unexpected obstacles may arise. The important thing is how you meet and overcome the challenges you face in life. For instance, maybe you struggled through your first year at Penn, and because of that, your GPA is lower than you'd like. Maybe you feel you don't have enough experience to be quote unquote qualified for a position, or that making a change to your career plans late in the game will make you look like you lack focus. Perhaps you don't have as many campus activities or research experiences to list on your resume as it seems your peers do, and that makes you feel self-conscious when applying for opportunities. Some other potential issues could be that you fell ill for a period of time or had an accident that impacted your experience in school, sometimes to the extent that forced you to take a temporary leave. Maybe you had an internship or job where there are things that just didn't go well, so you're worried about your references. And finally, maybe you had legal issues and you were unsure of how to address that on an application or in an interview. It can be difficult to know when to reveal the information that worries you most. Which is better? On the one hand, you may hope that these kinds of issues won't come up at all in an interview. On the other hand, there may be a feeling that if you can introduce the topic yourself, then you have the opportunity to shape the narrative and thus better control the conversation. So which is the right tactic? While it is true that you should always be prepared to speak about any incident in your past, Resist the urge to introduce these issues into an interview. Rest assured that if the incident or issue in question is also a concern for the employer, they will raise it themselves during the interview, and so you will certainly have the opportunity to share your side of the story. However, if by the time of the interview this particular issue has not arisen, chances are that it is not nearly as concerning to the employer as it is to you, or it would not have resulted in an interview in the first place. You introducing any said issues could, by contrast, create concern, because if you are concerned enough to proactively introduce it into the conversation, maybe they should be too. We'll now move through some general advice for addressing tough issues if an employer should raise them with you during an interview. When talking about your personal or professional past, there's no reason to outwardly volunteer negative information if not asked. For instance, if you're insecure about your GPA, there's no reason to bring it up unless the hiring manager or recruiter specifically asks. Oftentimes, if you're in an interview, they're already well aware of something like that because it's on your resume or on your transcript. And if they aren't and don't ask, maybe it's because it doesn't matter so much. That said, if you are asked to talk about something specifically, you'll want to be straightforward and direct in answering the question. Recruiters are good at sniffing out candidates who try to skirt around the question and not give a solid answer. And that comes across as lacking genuineness in an interview. Similarly, avoid being defensive. If you seem comfortable answering the question, this will automatically remove tension from the situation and make it seem like less of a big deal. If asked about a less than happy time in your life, perhaps a leave of absence you took for mental health reasons, your best approach will be to, again, be straightforward. Let's say a recruiter were to ask you why you took a leave for a semester. A not so great answer may be, I really hated my courses, my professors weren't helpful. I didn't feel like Penn could offer me anything positive, so I figured I may as well go home for a while. While all this may actually be true, what will be heard by the recruiter may not be very positive. They could hear you criticizing Penn's coursework and faculty, and that you are inclined to place the blame on others when things are difficult, a trait that could also present itself in the workplace. However, you do not want to say anything that is untrue to cover up something you would rather not discuss. So an equally problematic response to a question about a leave of absence or gap on your resume 
would be something to the effect of, I was called away on a very secret government mission. I'd love to tell you about it, but then I'd have to kill you. Bear in mind that these days, background checks are very thorough. And the internet provides potential employers a powerful research tool right at their fingertips. Being caught in a lie of any kind will certainly result in a poor interview performance and even a revoked job offer. Most recruiters can also sniff out excuses pretty quickly. If asked to explain a certain situation, take ownership and face it head on. Pointing fingers or explaining why something wasn't your fault won't impress a recruiter or hiring manager. So practice answering the hard questions by taking responsibility for your actions. Remember that recruiters are people too. They were once young, they have likely made mistakes, faced difficult obstacles, or handled unexpected challenges. Life and work are messy. And so on the job, there will be other obstacles ahead in one form or another, and the ability to deal with them can even be an asset. As such, interviewers are predisposed to be understanding of difficulties provided that you approach discussing them in the right way. When framing your responses, which is something you can practice ahead of time, be sure to be as truthful and factual as possible. Don't embellish or make something seem different than it really is. Don't compare yourself to others either, as the recruiter is disinterested in other people. The recruiter is interviewing you and therefore interested in you. Lastly, always be sure to highlight what you've learned from a mistake or negative experience. Getting back to our earlier example about what prompted you to take a leave of absence, you could answer, I found myself under a good deal of stress after overcoming a few challenges all in a row that semester. After careful discussions with my family, as well as consideration of my situation, it became clear that it was in my best interest to take some personal time away from school. I used that time to live a health-filled life where I was able to regroup gained some clear thinking and reprioritized my goals. I even incorporated some volunteering into my weekly routine, which enhanced my relevant skills for this job. I returned after my semester away, fully refreshed, focused, and excited about what's to come. This answer hopefully sounds better to you. With this response, a recruiter may hear that you're in touch with your needs and limitations, but also resilient and positive in nature. While what we previously discussed provides good general guidelines for approaching sensitive topics, each situation or circumstance is different. We would now like to go over specific strategies to address particular issues that you may face. At a highly competitive Ivy League institution with incredibly high academic standards, it can be tempting to want to contextualize or explain away disappointing grade on a harsh curve, mean professor, or even an extremely rigorous course of study. Particularly from students in disciplines such as the sciences or engineering, we hear things such as, well, if I had studied humanities, my grades would have been better. What if your interviewer happens to have a humanities background? Now you've just implied that their studies were easy, or at least not as difficult as yours, which is not the tone you want to strike in an interview. No matter how rigorous your course is, you can't fully comprehend the challenges faced by someone else's path, so it's best to stick to your own. The real reason you struggled with your grades is always the best one to provide, though perhaps not always the full extent of the story. For instance, it is not at all uncommon for students to have trouble adjusting to a new situation. So if during your first semester at Penn, whether as a first year or transfer student, you saw your grades drop, that is a scenario with which employers will be familiar. You could likely reasonably say, I had a tougher time adjusting to Penn than I anticipated. Classes were harder than I thought they would be, and in my eagerness to get involved, I took on too much too soon and didn't do a good job at the beginning of effectively balancing my time or practicing good study habits. However, during my second semester, I streamlined my activities, started taking advantage of resources such as Wine Garden to refine my study and time management skills, and proactively sought out professors during office hours when I didn't understand something. As you can see, since then, my grades have improved and continue to do so each semester. If a blip in your academic timeline occurred later, again, think about what was going on then and how you can briefly explain, focusing on what you learned and how things have gotten better since then. Finally, if the poor grades are in courses directly related to the roles for which you're interviewing, in addition to explaining what happened, you will also want to show how else 
you have been able to master this content and related skill set. What other ways have you continued to develop in this area since? It is not unusual for individuals to have had a career change of heart. Maybe you came into Penn pre-med and now you are on a different path. Perhaps you only just discovered an interest in consulting or finance. If a doctoral student, maybe you always thought you would pursue a role in academia and now you wanna work in industry instead. It's okay to switch gears. However, in instances when on paper, you will look like a candidate going down one path and now you wanna go in a different direction, you will want to work to repackage your experiences for a new audience. This will mean being able to clearly explain what draws you to your current area of interest and focusing on the transferable skills from your previous experiences. In other words, even if other work or extracurricular involvement is not directly related to what you would like to do now, chances are good that it required skills that are related, including things like teamwork, attention to detail, problem solving, analytical abilities, and more. As you search for internships or full-time roles, you will also want to build up your relevant experience base. Seek out volunteer or other experiences that will allow you to demonstrate a more current interest in this area. Think about things you may have already done that could count, class projects, extracurriculars, or even LinkedIn learning courses that show new content development in this area. Finally, your ability to speak knowledgeably and with confidence about this sector will help you be taken more seriously as a candidate, even if you do not yet have formal experience. Find out which trade publications to follow in your areas of interest and diligently research target organizations. Informational interviews with Penn alumni can be especially helpful in this area too. It is unlikely that a disability will be directly asked about during an interview. In fact, it is illegal for an employer to do so. However, there may be other behavioral questions or circumstances either during the interview itself where you will want to consider if the topic of disability is something you'd like to cover or as part of the assessment process related to the job. This is one area where you may want to volunteer information about a disability, even if not asked. So it breaks the rule we mentioned earlier. If the disability is unseen, there's no reason that your employer will have any reason to guess about it as, at all. Then the question becomes whether or not your disability requires accommodation for you to perform well on the job. For instance, if you have a learning disability and part of the job interview is a timed assessment, and normally you would get extra time for tests, you will want to think carefully about how to proceed. If you think you may need additional time in order to perform well on the assessment, you will probably want to ask for accommodation beforehand or if there is an alternate assessment that you can take. This is better than trying to explain away a poor performance, which you may not even know you achieved and simply not receive an invite to a second round interview. In an instance where the interview itself will require an accommodation for you to perform at your best, it is probably better for you to proactively disclose your disability to your potential employer before the interview itself. Give them a chance to accommodate you. Illness is another area that may be something that you could choose to disclose as a candidate during an interview as part of an answer to different kinds of questions. It may be the reason, for instance, that you took a leave of absence or had difficulty in a previous job. Whether or not it makes sense to disclose will probably depend upon if it is something that will impact your work in the role for which you are applying for now. Many years ago, we were working with a student who ended up being terminated from his internship in finance midsummer due to what was deemed unprofessional behavior. The employer contacted our office to complain about the student and describe the former intern as unreliable, that he was often late for work or would miss meetings. The final straw for them was when they had found him asleep at his desk in the middle of the day. They assumed that he was an irresponsible kid who didn't know how to manage his time well and wasted away his evenings partying, so he ended up being too tired to work to do his job. When we contacted the student to find out more and let him know of this employer's unhappiness, the student revealed to us that he in fact had narcolepsy and that this was the reason for his unpredictable work behavior. He sometimes slept through his alarm or uncontrollably fell asleep at work and missed meetings. He had been unfortunately too embarrassed about his condition to say anything to his managers about it, which had cost him the position. If this student had been more proactive, 
even at the start of his summer, to have had a conversation with his manager about his condition, it's possible that his employers could have been sympathetic and offered proactive solutions to allow him to still complete his work. In both a case of a disability or chronic illness, think carefully about when or even if it makes sense at all to disclose. If it requires accommodation on the job, a conversation with your manager either before or very soon after you start is likely the best approach. For those on medications to manage mental illness or disabilities, be aware of those that may turn up as part of a drug screening. For example, most ADHD medications are technically classified as narcotics, and those will cause you to fail a drug test. If you work for an organization that does random drug testing periodically or as part of a background check before joining an organization, you're probably better advised to disclose this information up front. While most employers are not going to think ADHD is a big deal, they certainly will be upset about you failing a drug test without an explanation, ideally proactively. So better to just be upfront. Other illnesses, either past or present, that may be difficult for an employer to easily accommodate, such as depression, anxiety, eating disorders, are likely to be of greater concern because these are all conditions compounded by stress. Even the best of work environments come with stress at least some of the time. As such, we recommend only broaching these issues in certain circumstances and very carefully. Having an experience gap on your resume or transcript is not necessarily a problem. People take time off for all kinds of reasons, personal, professional, and otherwise. Particularly during the pandemic, many people's job or internship plans were disrupted. And so now more than ever, a year or less of a gap is not likely to be an issue. That said, anytime there is an experience gap, employers will likely want to know what precipitated that time away and importantly, how you spent it. The key is to be able to demonstrate that you made the most of your time, whether it was planned or unplanned, so you can show that you are someone who takes advantage of opportunities to grow, to learn, create, and produce. If you took a semester off from school, were you able to pursue an internship during that time? Or maybe were you able to volunteer? If you lost or left a job because it wasn't the right fit, have you been working on learning new skills by taking free online courses or building up a new portfolio? Sometimes you may get a question during an interview like, what three adjectives would your previous supervisor use to describe you? Or what is one thing that a previous supervisor would say that you need to work on? These can be particularly difficult to answer if the relationship with a previous supervisor was sour. When this is the case, try to pull from other work experiences instead if you have them. If you weren't at the most recent position for very long, you could say, the supervisor with whom I worked the longest at the role before my most recent role, which was shorter, would describe me as, if however, this most recent position is also your only experience, or if you've had the misfortune to have the string of poor managers, think if there are others in the organization who could speak more positively about your work. If that's the case, you could answer something like, well, my supervisor and I had very different working styles, so we didn't always see eye to eye on things. However, my colleagues with whom I frequently collaborated on projects would describe me as the following. At the end of the interview or as part of an application when you're asked to list references and you know you cannot list a direct supervisor for whatever reason, think of others who could serve in that capacity. Are there previous supervisors that can fit the bill? Former professors who can speak to your work ethic? Other supervisor peers in your place of work who are familiar with your quality of work? Similarly, while previous arrests or convictions are not likely to be a part of a typical interview conversation, you should be prepared to discuss these incidents in your past, if relevant, since they may be part of a job application questionnaire or background check form. Federal agency background checks in particular are quite rigorous and could even uncover things that happened when you were a minor and you thought were expunged from your record. This was in fact the case with a family member of a colleague of ours who was applying for a position with the Federal Park Service, his dream job at the time. He was thrilled to receive a tentative offer pending a background check. He had a charge for underage possession on his record and he had been assured by a lawyer not to worry about it because it was from when he was a minor and his records were expunged so he could answer no to a job application question related to whether or not he had ever been arrested. However, despite his lawyer's assurances, the background check uncovered his charge and his offer was revoked. 
The recruiter called him and said it was really too bad because they didn't actually mind about the underage possession charge, that these things can happen. However, they couldn't overlook the fact that he lied about it on his application. It's important to prevent future damage as well. For instance, creating a professional online presence by having an updated LinkedIn account and including the link on your resume can help control what pops up in search results for your name. Also make smart choices moving forward. Something that could seem like an innocent prank now could have you paying a much larger price later. Think about something as fun or silly as streaking the quad, a college tradition like that, may seem like no big deal. However, if you are caught, that's an indecent exposure charge, which classifies you as a sex offender in many states. If you're hoping to work with children or be a teacher or in any other way work with youth, that may be a deal breaker or a risk that's just too large to bear. Similarly, consider the kinds of organizations that you would ideally like to work for and what their search processes may look like. For instance, if you're interested in working for federal agencies, particularly intelligence agencies, their background checks frequently include questions about drug usage going back multiple years. So if you're interested in government work such as that, you will likely want to consider curbing any recreational drug usage now. Maintaining positive relationships in the workplace is also necessary as most future employers will ask for references to speak about your abilities and work ethic moving forward. Even if you are in a role that you don't see yourself pursuing long term, it's critical to do great work so that your coworkers and supervisors will speak positively about you to future employers. While we provided some tips on handling a variety of difficult issues, that may come up in interviews, it's important to note that every person's situation is different. Each person's circumstances will present unique challenges and should be dealt with in an individualized way. We encourage you to take advantage of your resources, particularly here in Career Services, to work with our advisors who can help you home your customized approach to framing these conversations and answering these questions. Thanks for tuning in, and we hope to encounter you soon in Career Services.